Today I'm joined by Kathy Butler. Kathy is double Olympian, competed in the 1996 and 2004 Olympic Games in track and field. Welcome, Kathy. Thanks for me. Kathy, you competed in the longer running disciplines in track and field, and some people say it's this longer distance running is addictive. For those who don't like running too much, <laughs> what's the addictive part? I think once you get to the point where it feels easy, um, you just feel great. You know, you feel great while you're doing it. Not always, but and afterwards as well. So I think that is the addictive part. Um, sometimes it takes a little bit having had to come back for various reasons over the years to get to that point where it feels good. Not everyone ever gets there. So I think that's why it's hard to, to understand that good feeling. But, um, but also for me, it, you know, you get outside and um, you get to just get some fresh air and just makes you feel good that way as well. Yeah, I believe that. How did you get into it? At what time did you, at what age did you start with track and field and then yeah. specializing in the longer distances? So I started in, um, I was living in the UK. I was, uh, I guess I started a little bit in Scotland and then we moved to England. So, um, and they had a, just, you know, school sports where everyone in your class did everything against each other. And, um, you know, we did long jump and sprinting and um, the 800 was on a grass track. And um, I think it was 400 meters, but I don't exactly remember for sure. They said it was 800 meters race. And I beat everyone in my class, including the boys. So that kind of got me hooked on the middle distance running. Um, but at that point, I still did everything, you know, did other, other things as well as all the athletics disciplines, high jump and long jump and sprinting and a little bit of throwing. I wasn't very good at the throwing. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I kind of did a little bit of everything. And then I guess as I got a little bit older, the running stuff just, be I was more of a middle distance runner through most of um, high school, um, middle school, high school. We moved to Canada and I joined a club and um, just ran for the school and gradually got a little bit longer. Even in university, it was still um, not running. I didn't run anything longer than 5K and mostly 1,500, 3,000, 800. Um, and then got into the, so my first Olympics was when I was still in university and that was 5,000 meters. And that was kind of at the time, the longest I raced and then gradually ran some 10 Ks and stuff as I got older. And then eventually a few marathons, but mostly middle to long distance track events. Yeah. <laughs> in your athletic life, what was your darkest moment? Uh, <laughs> um, I guess there's probably a couple, but so I know it's supposed to be one moment. But when I was at the World Cross Country Championships in uh, 94 in uh, Hungary, in, in Budapest in Hungary, I really didn't feel very good and um, wasn't able to sleep. I had a resting heart rate that was super high. Didn't know what was going on. Um, didn't, uh, I started the race but didn't finish and just felt terrible. I got back and I had lost a bunch of weight and went to the, just the university health doctor And luckily for me, they figured out that I had um, Graves' disease, which is an autoimmune uh, problem with the thyroid. And so at that point, they basically said, no running. You, if you run, you might have a heart attack. Because um, my heart was, even just walking around, my heart rate was like 100. You know, normally resting heart rate for me would be like 45 or 50. Um, and then, you know, it was, it was really, really high. Um, if I went for a walk, it would go to 130, 140, which is like, should be just running, running heart rate. Um, so they, yeah, no running. I didn't know if I was going to be able to run ever again. Um, so the thyroid is kind of tricky. You know, they worked through it. They put me on medication and I had just, just signed, um, paperwork right when all this was happening to go on scholarship to the United States. So it was all very much up in the air. My like university degree was tied to, you know, this scholarship and running and I just didn't know what was going to happen. So that was probably... Uh, yeah, one of the, the darkest moments for sure. And what happened? I mean, you competed in the 96, Olympi 96 yeah. Olympics. So within two years, at least you got to a decent level again. 
Yeah. So it, um, it took a little bit, it took the summer. So this, that was like March world cross country was March. Um, the whole summer was kind of, fun, um, of fi trying to figure it out by the end I got back and ran the Canadian, um, championships actually ran. Okay. But, but up until that point, they put me, you know, ran a bunch of tests and, and I was able to, to keep running. And then they said that, the type of medication you can only be on it for a maximum of a year to a year and a half. So then, so of course now we've got Olympics coming up, you know, at the time I didn't even, wasn't on my mind initially to try and make the Olympic team. But, uh, so in that time period, so I was on the medication for a year and a half. So that took us to almost the end of 95. And then they decided to take me off it and see what happened. So pretty risky normally as like a elite athlete, you wouldn't mess around with something like that within a year, less than a year of the Olympics. It, you know, they test it still, however many years, a few years later. And uh, it's, it's been okay. It kind of goes up and down sometimes, but I haven't, the more extreme options would have been that they would have had to um, radioactively remove my thyroid or surgically remove it. And then I would have had to take a different kind of medication for the rest of my life. But luckily it went into remission and it's been, Okay, autoimmune stuff is weird. They don't really know why it started or why I was lucky and able to end up in remission. And yeah, literally from when they took me off the medication, I qualified for the Olympics, I uh, must have been six, seven months later. So it was, yeah, it just all worked out, I guess. But uh, um, lots of doctors help and, you know, um, I just didn't know what was going to happen. And maybe um, both of my dark moments have been two years before an Olympics, Olympic Games. So I don't know if it was just that sort of, I'm going to, you know, come back from this attitude that allowed me to come back even better. Um, having had it sort of taken away so close to an Olympics made me fight even more for it. I'm not sure. But um, yeah, the other one, I had a fairly major injury in 2002. And I mean, 2000 was a whole nother, that was a dark point also, because I didn't, make the Olympic team. But uh, 2002, I had a pelvis injury that they weren't sure. Same thing. I don't know if you're ever going to be able to run again, that whole kind of um, severe pelvis injury problem. And then I was on crutches and didn't, wasn't able to do any exercise for a while. And uh, it took me about a year to come back. And then the year following that year to come back was the best year of my running career. So mm. yeah, a couple of, a couple of dark moments and usually mostly tied to medical type things. Um, either injury or illness. And the missing 2000 Olympics was due to anemia, which as a coach now seems like such a ridiculous reason to miss an Olympics. But um, that was also a hard, a hard moment to not be, by the time the Olympics actually happened, I was healthy and running well, but um, I was anemic and missed making the team. So um, yeah, <laughs> I guess those are my big three. Yeah. I feel like I wasn't even really a very injury prone or illness prone athlete but um yeah those moments stick in my mind for sure <laughs> yeah uh, i've actually taken this as a note for later but as you just mentioned two years out of both of your olympic participations you had a major setback how did you stay strong in that time um i think it it just almost made me want to fight more to have what was taken away from me um not to say that i took it for granted before But uh, I think having it taken away made me realize how, mu how much it meant to me, uh, how much I like to be able to just even be able to go out and train hard, whether that training hard resulted in the performances that I wanted or not. It kind of didn't matter at that point. You're like, I just, I just want to be able to go out and, and run hard. Um, so I think that was probably what kept me going and just looking for improvements every day. Um, at times it was, you know, the, The pelvis injury, I was on, on crutches. I wasn't even allowed to really, they were forgetting, you know, to the car to go for physio. Like the, the crutch, I was supposed to just pretty much just do nothing. Um, so that was, that was difficult. And same with when they first told me I couldn't do anything because I could have a heart attack with the Graves disease. Just not being able to do anything, those were probably the hardest times. Um, and, you know, typically during most of those, I found something else to do. Uh, I remember during, when I was on crutches, um, I took my first coaching education um, course. Uh, hadn't taken any formal, my degree was in, or is in exercise physiology and biology, but 
I hadn't taken any actual coaching education. So in 2002, I went along to like the UK athletics at the time, like first beginning level coaching ed education class. And people that were like, you know, you're an elite athlete. You can skip to level three. You don't need to take this one. And I was like, well, I got to do something because I can't do anything right now. So I went along and, you know, learned how to coach the long jump and how to do a shot put throwing square and, you know, the basics of, uh, of coaching. And uh, yeah, probably just having other things to do during those times helped a lot. Um, and, you know, you get caught in the world of doctors and physios and days go by fast. <laughs> hmm, I believe that. What was your best moment? I think uh, my best moment... Can I have two? Is that allowed? Oh, how, uh, as many as you would like. <laughs> uh, probably the, okay, the first best moment, let's go with that, was uh, winning the NCAA cross country championships. Um, so this whole, you know, kind of stuff with the, the thyroid and everything and going to school in the States had all kind of happened. I was a transfer. I'd gone to school in Canada for a couple of years first and then, um, so I had one year kind of under my belt. I'd won a track title at that point. But to win the cross country, everybody runs cross country. You've got everyone from the 800, 1500 meter runners to the 10K runners, you know. And um, I've always loved cross country. Uh, but some of my best um, performances on the international level have been in cross country. And so just, um, you know, to go out and at the time, you know, you see all these other kind of like people that you've looked up to or kind of big names on the start line with you. And um, I kind of, it was one of those races where I put everything out there really early on and just went for it and had a big lead and people were catching me for sure, but I managed to hold on to the, to the win at the end. And um, that was probably up there and also having um, cross country for, for runners anyway is unique because we have a team there. So you have your support of your team, not just your, your team that you have, like, you know, your coach and all, you know, that kind of team, but actually having a team competing together. So to cross the finish line and then be able to see, you know, your teammates come in and see how you did as a team also have that support, I think in cross country is huge. So that was, yeah, pretty big, pretty big event. Um, Should I go on to the next one or do you want to ask about that one? <laughs> What did you learn from that one? How has it improved okay. your life? Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, it, it was sort of the, how important it was to me to not only put everything into a singular goal for myself, but that it's also um, important to be part of something bigger. Um, so to be part of the team or to be representing your university and, you know, it's, it, it never becomes just about you. I think if I, if I had just been there by myself and crossed the finish line and won, yes, it would have been great. And there were many other races kind of like that later in my professional career, but to be there um, as a group and part of that team was, was, was really important. And I think it made me kind of realize how having that connection um, with other people makes whatever you do in life more important. Um, you're not just out there doing your thing on your own. Um, and I try to do that now with my coaching with, uh, you know, have a post post collegiate group here in Boulder in Colorado and, um, just having them connected to each other makes them, um, so much more sort of committed to their own running, but also takes them out of themselves when they're having a bad day and allows them to, to perform better and also just get more out of more out of their running and it sort of reflects better on their life. Because sometimes you kind of think, well, what's all this sports stuff about? You know, why am I doing this? Um, you can have those kind of big questions as an athlete, as well as as a coach, you know, like, what are we really doing here that's bettering the world? Um, but, you know, having these people go on to use those skills and also take that dedication into other parts of their life and the relationships that they build with people, I think to me is the most important part of sport, not just um, you know, how fast someone runs or how far they throw something. Um, so I think, yeah, that was a long answer to a question about what I learned from running, winning a race, but yeah. <laughs> that's, what it, that's what it's all about, isn't it? Yeah. The yeah. lessons learned. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. So that was, yeah, that was, that was big. And I, I guess I had one other making the uh, 2004 Olympic team was probably the next I had missed the um, qualifying standard by 
how much did I miss it by 0.4 over 10 K. Mm. So that's like, I don't even know what that is per lap, but it after over 25 laps, 0.4 of a second is nothing. And um, so everything came down to our trials. I had to get the time and finish in the top two in order to make the Olympic team. And there was a friend of mine and myself, and we just kind of worked together and, you know, we were lapping people and sometimes running in lane two and um, just really had to go for it. And um, even with like probably three laps to go, it wasn't certain that I would still make the time. Um, and so, you know, just really going for it after all the disappointments of being injured and having just missed the time six weeks before, and then to come back and, I made the time and unfortunately my friend missed it by 0.14, which is even crazier over 10 K. Um, so she didn't get to be on the Olympic team. She tried again and didn't get the time, but, um, yeah, she was European champion in cross country. She had many other things she did, but yeah, it, uh, that was a big, a big moment just to get on that Olympic team after eight years, eight years is a really long time in the career of an athlete to, to wait to get back on the Olympics, go back to the Olympics. So yeah, that was, that was a huge, huge, I didn't think I slept at all the night after. So. <laughs> <laughs> What did you learn from this moment? Uh, I think just more the sort of persistence of sticking with something over a longer time. Um, sort of the stuff that happened, even with being sick when I was younger and all the stuff that happened in my kind of late teens, early twenties was, you still kind of feel like you have time on your side <laughs> and you're, you know, you have like all this time to do these things and have these performances. And um, yeah, but by then it was kind of like, okay, you know, if I don't make it now, um, you know, I was 30, is that right? 29, 30. Um, and you're kind of thinking, well, like this, yeah, people go on and people make many more Olympic teams later in life than that. But it's the exception rather than the rule. So I think it was kind of the persistence of having gone eight years and really having, you know, having had another, you know, setback and just having to really stick with something. Um, and that, you know, even if, you know, I coach quite a lot of athletes now that are just out of university and they want everything now and they want to have their very best performance at 24 And, you know, I kind of have to, I, I have to be that person who says to them, like, no, you've got like another 10 years, you know, have patience. And it's hard, you know, it's hard when you're 22, 23, 24, to think like, okay, this is the long game, we're here for a while. But um, I think that was the main thing that I've taken forward from that and have used, you know, was just that, you know, it, it doesn't, just because you don't get it right now, doesn't mean it's not going to happen. Mm. That's a powerful one, yeah. <laughs> What advice would you give a younger you if you could travel back in time, 15, 20, 30 years, what advice would you give a younger Casey? <laughs> uh, don't neglect your blood test though. No. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, obviously I knew this question was coming. I knew it was going to be a hard one for me. Um, I think probably the same thing that I, some of those lessons I learned from the older me as an athlete was just to have some patience. Um, But then, you know, you also don't want to deny the, the now either. Like if someone is, is doing well, you don't want to be like, oh, you know, you're not supposed to do that for like another six years. Sorry, you can't do that right now. So, but to have patience, but also enjoy the moment that I was in at the time, rather than always looking ahead to the next thing. Um, just really enjoy the, the travel and the lifestyle of, of being an athlete um, and sort of getting out there and meeting So that's some of my best memories looking back um, are all the people that I met. And, you know, there was a time when I had probably more friends that lived, you know, in other places than I lived than I did where I lived. But uh, um, just, you know, making sure to enjoy that and get to stay in touch. It's easier now to stay in touch with those people. That makes me sound really old. But, you know, like <laughs> just making sure to enjoy those moments of travel and, um, you know, living that kind of lifestyle. Um, But I suppose also to always be thinking about the future. I think I did a pretty good job. Like I said, you know, I took coaching education when I was injured or I did other, you know, took courses and that kind of thing. But um, every once in a while I wish, you know, oh, maybe I should have taken, you know, more master's credits or, you know, I should have done this or, you know, maybe that's just the, 
the me wanting to have more stuff now, I don't know, like more credentials and that kind of thing. But um, making sure to have balance, I guess, would be the big thing to not neglect um, the other aspects of your life. It becomes a very um, singular pursuit, high level athletics. Um, so it sometimes you need that singular focus, but also taking the time to maybe have a little bit more downtime every now and then would probably be a a bit more of a recommendation. Maybe I wouldn't have done what I did or maybe I would have done more. I don't know. It's hard to say. You never know. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's a balancing act, right? You need to be very, yeah. very focused on your goal. Yeah. So, which comes with what you just said, very single-minded. Yeah. And yeah. Then, you know, letting go is also probably difficult. Yeah, and I think um, like when I, I kind of ran all the way through to when I had my daughter and... Um, sort of had a little comeback after her, but I think for me, it was kind of like, that was the point where I was like, okay, I'm no longer the focus. I can't put that kind of singular focus in anymore. Um, for, some people can, some people can have kids and have careers and still manage to be like a high level athlete. But for me, it was, you know, I, I couldn't split myself that way. And it was a good point to be, be done with athletics at that point as an athlete anyway. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> What are the habits that make you a successful athlete and or person? Uh, I think probably you're getting the, the idea already <laughs> that I'm a pretty good planner. Like, um, and like I, I'm always looking for the next thing to be doing. Um, so like the first thing, you know, that I did when I had extra time at home um, for this, you know, this whole COVID-19 thing was that I... Um, I started working on like presentations and um, things for, you know, that I hadn't, I'd been putting off because I had time. Um, so for me, just always looking for the next, what else could I be doing to improve what, so that happens now in coaching, but at, as, as an athlete, it was always kind of, okay, what else could I be doing without overdoing it? Like I always tried to make sure I had the recovery time and um, yeah. So I think being able to balance, which, you know, I just told myself from 20 years ago to have more balance, but I think I actually did a pretty good job um, as, a, as an athlete of having balance. Um, so I think that was probably one of my main habits. Um, and just, just being consistent with things, um, not trying to do everything today, but just knowing that it's consistency over time um, was probably a, a, major, a major thing for me. Um, it did take a while sometimes to get the results that I wanted to get. Um, and, you know, sometimes you're just not in the right race at the, on the right day or you know, it doesn't happen. So just making sure that, you know, like that it's, if you keep working at it, it'll happen. That's a, was a main habit and still is a fine. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned that before persistency and consistency, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think, I don't think I would have been any good as like a, a gymnast whose career was done by the time they were 18. <laughs> You know, <laughs> well, that wouldn't have been enough time to keep working at something. <laughs> yeah, good. You competed for two different countries. Yeah. What was the reason behind that? So I have kind of a, a varied past in terms of where I've lived. I was born in Scotland um, in the United Kingdom. And then we lived, my parents were English and we lived in England as well for a year. And then my dad's job moved us to Canada. So I started off, you know, I was a Canadian citizen, became a Canadian citizen when I was 15 and also had my British citizenship. And so started off as a junior athlete competing in, you know, Canada locally and um, then competing internationally for Canada. But it was always kind of one of those things in kind of like the background that I was like, oh, you know, it would be nice to compete for the country of my birth. Um, so then I had, once I was a senior athlete and, um, traveling and able to kind of go back to the UK. My ended up by a weird, just the way things worked out that my manager was based in, in London. So um, I was over there all the time anyway, and just getting talking to him and saying how I would have liked to have competed, you know, for uh, Britain. And so he's like, well, why don't you type of thing, you know? So I made the switch. It was hard though, because, um, you know, I definitely feel, I think there's a lot of people out there now that have lived in multiple countries and it, you feel a little bit split 
you know, like there's, and now I live in America, so, but I don't actually have American citizenship, but, uh, you know, like you just feel like it's definitely, they're both part of you. And I think for some people who've only ever lived in one place, they maybe have a harder time understanding, like, how can you feel like you're both? But, but I do, you know, I feel like I'm both British and Canadian, and now I have this life in America as well. Um, but I, I don't think it's as simple as just being one thing, you know? And I definitely got criticized and there was some stuff brought up about like, oh, is it because we're not supporting, you know, like in uh, parliament in Canada, they're like, are we not supporting our athletes well enough? Um, and there was definitely some elements of competing for Canada where I wasn't as well supported as it would have been nice to have been, but that wasn't the main reason for, you know, it just felt like it was something that I wanted to do was to compete for the country that I was born in. Um, so I went back and competed for them and it was, yeah, it was a little bit of a tough transition. You feel like, you know, the, the new kid at school on like in the middle of the school year kind of, um, but it, you know, everyone was very welcoming and it ended up being a great experience for me. And I'm, I'm really glad I did get to do both. Um, I obviously don't know it any other way, but, um, if I look back on my career, the fact that I got to have you know, half of it competing for Canada and half of it competing for Great Britain was like sort of the best way for me to have it. I, I couldn't have asked for anything better. Mm, cool. Do you have a morning routine? <laughs> uh, not during COVID. <laughs> a non-COVID morning routine. <laughs> or as an athlete. As an athlete. Um, yeah, I mean, I had, I wasn't uh, like a morning like workout early morning workout person. Um, as a professional athlete, you have the luxury of kind of optimizing when you do those things. So either, um, yeah, get up and, you know, have breakfast and tea or now I drink coffee. I didn't when I was an athlete, really. Um, and then um, get out for like an easy run usually was kind of the main routine stretch. Um, yeah, it's, it's not anything too exciting, you know. Um, and I guess it's kind of stuck, like still get up, eat a little something, have a little something to drink, go for a run. Um, but I feel like it does get me started pretty well for the day. Uh, I don't run every day now, so sometimes I take my, my old dog for a walk instead. But um, yeah, just kind of, I guess it was just consistency of the same kind of routine every day. Get up and get up, eat, run. <laughs> Running's not always glamorous. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that. How do you prepare for important moments? I think um, practice, practice, practice. <laughs> um, both, uh, you know, physically, obviously, as, as a former competitive athlete, a lot of your practice went into something physically. But uh, so just making sure you have taken care of all the things that you needed to physically. But while doing that, um, and I don't know, I guess now I kind of look back on it more and realize that there was a lot more sort of psychology involved than I realized at the time. But um, all of that physical practice is also mental practice. Um, you're always thinking about um, why I'm doing this training for this race and you know all those kind of, so you sort of always kind of have the races in the back of your mind. Um, so that'd be the main thing. And then finding ways to um, have downtime especially before big competitions, uh, you know, books and movies. And when, when you're stuck, you know, Olympic villages are not ideal places prior to big competitions. Um, you know, they're loud and <laughs> there's people partying because they're already done with their competitions. Athletics is at the end of the championships and um, just being able to kind of block out as many distractions as possible. Um, whether it's listening to music or watching movies. I used to do all those, all the kind of things. Um, just, yeah, very, I, I was, when I was an athlete, I was the, the queen of very long coffee or tea breaks, you know, with friends. Like you just talk about whatever, anything but running usually. But uh, yeah, just, it, it's sort of a balance between complete focus and complete distraction. <laughs> yeah. How do you overcome setbacks? Uh, I think, uh, yeah, I think I'm always just looking for the, a way to improve for the future. Um, but there has to be kind of like a acceptance of the disappointment as well. Um, when you have a setback, whether it's, 
um, something that you can really put a finger on and be like, okay, yeah, I didn't get that right. That was, that was on me or whether you feel like it was something completely out of your control. Um, you know, the two, the two Olympics, 2000 and 2008 that I didn't, I tried to qualify and didn't make, um, the, they were kind of out of my control type of things. And I think it's like just having to let it go and giving yourself time to be upset about it. But then, you know, kind of just being like, well, okay, now we have to move on. What, what's the next thing that we're going to do? Um, are we going to be done with this? No, not ready to be done. Okay. So if I'm not ready to be done, what's the, what's the next phase? And sometimes it's hard because the next phase is to take a break from training. Right. And that's the last thing you want to do. You want to go back and train even harder, but um, yeah, just, just always having a plan and knowing where you want to go next. And you don't always know exactly how you're going to get there, but having the steps in place to get there. Focus on the process. Yeah, exactly. That's the current term for it. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. Who's your role model and why? Uh, so when I was young, as a young athlete, I kind of had two sets of role models and I'm kind of, it's kind of sad that they were all men when I think about it now, <laughs> but um, it just is the way it was. But, uh, you know, I was just realizing what athletics was around the time of um, Steve Cram, Steve Ovet, Sebco, all of those like really top level middle distance runners in the UK. So they were kind of like my big, you know, kind of like amazing people. And as I was so, that was right, we were just about, we were in the UK and then we left and we moved to Canada. And I, a few years later, I made like this indoor, indoor meet as a, as a kid, you know, as a high schooler. And I went to this indoor meet and I go out, you know, next to the tra track side during the meet. There's like big, big stadium, Hamilton, Hamilton Spectator Indoor Games is what it was called. It was, it was a big meet at the time. And I look over and Steve Cram is standing right next to me. And I'm like, I don't know, 15 or something. And I just like, you know, it was one of those moments like, are you supposed to meet your heroes? I don't know. And I just like, it was sort of everything kind of came around like, okay. You know, and I asked him for his autograph and it's like, I have all of maybe three autographs ever in my whole life. And he was one of them. But the funny thing is that like I, later on as an athlete, I got to know him as just a regular person later on. And it's kind of funny, you know, he just kind of seemed to keep popping up in my life. He was a hero and a role model early on. And then he, um, he became like somebody that I knew as a, just a regular person. <laughs> um, so then, and then I actually like the, um, I had some ski role models, even though I didn't really compete at skiing. So like the crazy Canucks were like the big thing back like in the eighties. And so they were kind of watching them compete in the winter Olympics and um, how well they did was the, was a big role sporting role model back, back then. Um, and then uh, I had a few coaching role models too, but <laughs> are we talking about coaching? Or are we talking about ath athletics? But yeah. So th those were from a young age, those were my main, main role models. What is the best advice you received and who gave it to you? Yeah. <laughs> this is tough. Um, I had my high school coach was, he's, oh, he's still around. He's still a very good coach, but he, um, he was very big into sort of um, philosophy of all of this stuff. I and mean, we used to have, you know, we used to drive to Toronto. We'd drive and he'd, he'd be, most of the time he'd be like this. He'd be looking in the back seat talking to us and we're like driving down the highway. But, uh, His big thing was that it, uh, it should mean everything and nothing at the same time. Um, and I think that probably always stuck with me from, from when I was, you know, 15 or 16 all the way through. Um, and even now in coaching, um, cause it ultimately it's sport and it's important and it's okay that it's important. Um, but I feel like that one piece of advice, everything and nothing really kind of stuck with me and, has continued to stick with me to this day. Hmm. How did a typical training day look like in the life of an athlete? Uh, life of an athlete, um, yeah, get up, morning routine, get up, eat, drink, run. Um, and then usually, uh, you know, some kind of stretching or um, like kind of physio type exercises, injury prevention stuff, and then maybe, um, If, I, if it wasn't a hard session day, then probably some kind of 
massage or physio potentially somewhere along the other way. Um, and then if it was a hard session day, then um, typically we did our hard sessions in the afternoon. Um, so then go to the track and by mid afternoon and be at the track for three hours. And so, yeah, so there's one training session in the morning and then um, three or four hours of training, sometimes followed by some lifting or, um, you know, that kind of strength type work afterwards. Um, and then lots more food. Well, there was food in the middle there somewhere too, I think. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, bed or watch a movie in bed. Um, pretty, you know, day in, day out, you know, twice a day, most days, usually had a, a rest day um, every week, which for some people is, they don't have that. But for me, it worked. I think it just helped my body fully recover. Um, but then I trained really hard on all the other days. <laughs> so um, yeah, I'm just staying on top of all the little things, massage, physio, and then training twice a day was pretty standard. <laughs> Yeah. You're giving back a lot of your knowledge through online coaching. Tell us more about that. What can people expect? So when I, um, I do both, you know, in-person coaching and then online. And typically uh, when people get in touch with me, it's not for your bog standard. Like here's a 16 week training program that's already preset and um, ready to go. It's uh, very individual. So I have different kind of people get in touch with me, but sometimes it's the person who's really busy with work and they're trying to fit training around their lifestyle. Um, or it's someone who's really trying to push the boundaries of what they can do physically. Um, so just really kind of um, very individualized training. Um, but they also get a fair bit of um, why, not just the what. Um, ideally, I like to have people, you know, be able to move on. I mean, maybe they move on and don't, I don't coach them anymore because they have learned enough that they can do it on their own. Uh, it depends on the individual, but yeah, trying to make sure that they understand why we're doing things um, and why, what's specific to them and the things that they're training for. Um, and, you know, I do, I do some coaching, um, coach development, coaching education. And I think that's sort of just part of me. Like I want them to understand, you know, different people want to learn different amounts Some people have a million questions and they're very curious about the what and the why, and they maybe have some background and they want to know, you know, so why do you, you know, some stuff I use is super low tech, you know, like I don't, you know, and sometimes people come to me, especially the triathletes and they're like, they want everything to be super high tech. And I'm like, mm. no, just this, this run should just be like, feel easy. You know, you should be able to talk to your friend. And they just, sometimes they have a hard time with that, but, um, Yeah, just very personalized, one-on-one, -on -one, um, specific to the individual type of training. Um, and then just trying to get to know them, even though they're maybe on the other side of the world. Um, I have an athlete in Colombia, and I feel like I kind of know him, even though we've never met. You know, I, I know his dog's name and how much running his dog can handle and, you know, that he has his kid and then, you know, his wife and all these things, like, just like... Um, creating a relationship, even though you may never meet. <laughs> um, we missed the guy in Colombia. We missed each other in New York in December by like three hours. It, we just, it just didn't work. We were like trying to make it work to meet each other, but it didn't happen. Maybe one day, but um, yeah, just making sure that you get as much feedback as you, back as you can. We have like all the electronic feedback now, you know, you get all this data from their watch or from whatever but it doesn't substitute for really kind of getting to know someone and talking to them. And um, how, how did you feel about this run? You know, why did you feel that way? Was it because, you know, you woke up on the wrong side of the bed and just, to, you know, something went wrong that morning or is it because there's something else going on physically? Um, so just kind of solving the, all the puzzles that go with coaching that individual. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. A bonus question here. Um, yeah. it's often asked when it comes to online coaching, coaching is often be considered as something in person. So, and then online coaching obviously is not in person. So how can you make online coaching work? So I think I try to make it much more than just about, um, the prescription of training. You know, it's not just as simple as run five miles, do three times a mile hard, or um, it is about the relationship with the person. 
Um, sometimes that means um, it's whatever level of communication works for that person. It could be um, talking on the phone. It could be getting some video of them running. Um, just, you know, lots of emails. Lots. Of, it's, it's definitely different from the group that I coach in person. Um, although I'm kind of glad that I have the online coaching background at the moment because it's helping with my athletes that are used to seeing me in person. It's helping me know what kind of levels of communication I need in order to have a good relationship with them right now. And some of them I haven't seen in two months now. Um, and, or I've seen them like, you know, but not actually seen them train um, from a distance. I've seen them, but uh, yeah. So I think it's just all about communication um, in order to have that relationship. And then as much feedback as you can get, whether it's video or um, GPS watch or, you know, all those, you know, how they felt, you know, perceived exertion, all those kind of things. Um, but it, I mean, it's definitely different. You, you have to find different ways to communicate and um, try and have like their personality and your personality still be relevant, even though um, it's only stuff written down. Um, you know, I try to change things up and, you know, see if they're paying attention, throw things in there and, and see what happens. And um, yeah, I mean, I think, and getting to know, like I actually use, I'll often look at where they live and try to find you know, that sort of connection there, like, oh, you have this hill, like, you know, go run on like Rabbit Street Hill or whatever, you know, like, that, that looks like a good hill. And they'll be like, what do you mean, Rabbit? That's, that's just around the corner. You're like, yeah, yeah, go run there or go run in that park, you know. So just trying to make, understand their lives and be as involved as, not too much involved, but, you know, as you should be as a coach, you know. Yeah. Do you want to nominate someone to be interviewed? Um... <laughs> There's lots of people I'd like to nominate, but I don't know if they would let you interview them or not. <laughs> no, like I would love to have you interview my college coach who coached me after, but he's now 80 years old and I don't think it's not really his thing, you know, but uh, although you could interview him maybe in a different language because he speaks many languages. But uh, so, so yeah, it's kind of funny, like the, all the sort of how personal people are. Um, so I kind of, that was, that's one I might have to reserve for like the future. And then I might have to get back to you and be like, Hey, remember when you wanted someone? Okay. I talked to them and this is the person. <laughs> that's cool. No worries. <laughs> that's cool. So what else is going on in your life at this moment in time? You're coaching? Coaching. Um, yeah. So coaching is good. It's weird, but it's good. Um, we've been trying. So the group has been still meeting by video chat twice a week. Um, And we have been doing a, like a series of different things. Sometimes we do like a body weight strength or like limited kettlebell type hand weight strength session. Um, and then we've had a series of guest speakers, um, everything from uh, physio doctors, um, dietitians, sports psychologists have talked to the group, um, just trying to stay as connected as we can um, in that environment. Uh, I've done a series of sort of, things for them. I did a, um, I've done three like sort of lecture things with them to kind of um, let them have a bit more insight into why we do what we do while we have this time together. That's weird. Um, so yeah, coaching is, it's pretty good. It's, it's almost busier than normal. Um, other than the fact that I'm not traveling anywhere on a regular basis to coach in person. Um, the sort of, you know, day to day stuff is pretty busy. So that's, that's good. Um, I do miss like the in-person coaching um, and really hope we get back to that soon. Um, there's no substitute for sure to just seeing someone walk up to, you know, finish their warm up and walk over and you can just see, you know, whether today is the right day for what you had planned or not. Mm -hmm. um, and you can't do that when you've given it to them and they have to just go do it by themselves. So, and just the interaction with the athletes I miss, I, I really, I'm looking forward to when we can be back there. Luckily, we're outside. Um, so once facilities open up, um, we can have, we might have to split the group or something to make it small enough, but, and make sure nobody's too close to each other or something. But I think we, sh we sh should be okay to meet in person, hope sooner than later. But yeah, so, so that, and then, you know, we have, I don't want to call it homeschooling because it's not homeschool. We have school happening at home. Uh, for my daughter and um, 
combining, you know, she was, she just finished, she came upstairs, but she was on video chat with school, you know, at the same time as this. Luckily our internet allows for two video chats at the same time. Um, and so, yeah, the, the weirdness that is that is happening. And, but you know, life goes on, flowers start to bloom and spring is happening in the mountains. So uh, we, we missed the end of ski season, which was kind of a bummer, but um, you know, it's, we have a pretty good, pretty good life. We have space. If I could show you, we have like trees all around and yeah, it's, it's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Where can people find you? So they can, um, I have a website. So it's Kathy, K-A-T-H-Y dash uh, butler.com. Um, they can find me on Twitter, uh, which is at Chutler, C-H-U-T-L-E-R. Um, The Twitter I kind of use as my like science geek out kind of place where I go and look for research and um, sort of my coaching, coach development, coaching side of me. Um, so that's what you'll find on there. Um, and then uh, the club and myself both have Instagram. Mine is at Chutler as well. And then Run Boulder is the, the club. Uh, Run Boulder one tends to be more running related. The Chutler one right now you find mostly like cooking stuff <laughs> or or whatever messing around in the mountains type stuff but uh yeah those are probably the main the main places that you can find me and the online coaching service are on your website yep all on the website um or you can contact me um by email um and that's all on the website too um linkedin all of those kind of things all those modern ways of finding me Typically, if you put running coach and my name in, you'll, you'll find it. You might find some embarrassing pictures of me from back in the day as well. But, you know, not as many as if I had run like 10 years later. So, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, pretty easy to find. Awesome. Thank you for your time, yeah. Kathy. That was awesome. Yeah, it was great to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. And good luck. <laughs>